you know, with some old business. Does anyone have it? Did anyone try a Benson Labs? Any questions? No. Okay, good. You asked if we'd use the Benz I have. Oh, you have in the past. Okay. Do you recommend it to others? Not anymore. Oh, what's I found that? something better. Oh, what's better? Gaia, G A I A. G, G A I A. I mean, what does that do? It, uh, it, it's a whole lot easier to download the maps and you can plot your routes before you go. Uh, it's really nice. Can you download custom maps or do you just have to take what's available from the store or uh, online? Use, the, it, you download uh, Topo maps okay. as well as, as Gaia's own maps. Okay. Um, but you can do that all on your own computer and then put it on your iPhone or iPad or whatever. Okay. And then, then let's have a test. Who remembers what, what clips I recommended that you remember on the grand staircase? Pink clips or the red flare on? Chocolate. Chocolate. Is the shimmer on? White and pink. White is, yeah, white is the Navajo and then pink is, pink is the uh, red clairon and vermilion is, is the Kayenta. We'll look at those in a little bit more detail today. Disclaimers as usual. Uh, today is a survey of places to see, not how to use Google Maps. So if you get, get high centered on a rut, you get stuck in the sand, you have three flat tires, and the road is washed out, don't blame Vandry. I'm not telling you how to get there. I'm just <laughs> saying uh, use Google Maps. Do homework before going, including hiking conditions, fees, and off-pavement road conditions. Again, always call with the maintenance agency or the land manage management agency to get conditions on roads. Grand Staircase, I think, publishes monthly reports. My focus is on the landscape and geology more than history. Many of the places we will look at today are, include, are included in Steve's book. He focuses more on the history. The shadow highways parallel or are in close proximity to Armeo's red travel way. So again, the travel way is in red and we're going to be looking at US 160, Arizona 98, US 89, US 89A, Arizona 389, Utah 59, Utah 9, and I-15. Those are the shadow highways that are close proximity to Armillo's travel way. Can you recognize the different government lands and Indian reservations? They're color-coded, so tan is Indian reservation, dark green is national parks, fluorescent green is national monuments, the Green in between are recreation areas, and the light green are national forests. So, what's you, you know what reservation this is? It's the Navajo. It's the largest reservation in the country, and you can see much of the travelway is on reservation lands. Okay, national park, Grand Grand Canyon, national park. Oh, no, I'm sorry, National Park right here. That's Canyonlands, Capitol Reef, Recreation Area, Glen Canyon, Grand Canyon, okay, Parishmont, Grand Canyon, Parishmont National Monument, Staircase, it's Carapits and Escalante divisions also. How about National Forests? That's the Manti LaSalle, or that's the LaSalle portion. This probably is the Fish Lake, and I think this is the Fish Lake. And these three are Dixie National Forest, Kaibab National Forest, 
And then Indian Reservation. Paiute Kaibab, Shivowitz. The yellow is BLM, and then the blue is our state lands. The gray areas are the remaining after the recent reduction in national monument sizes. So you can see that Grand Staircase and Bears Ears is quite a bit smaller now than originally created or designated. Tis nas pas, near the Four Corners area, refers to cottonwoods in a circle. It's a possible location for our Mio's November 22nd stop. At the spring of Navajo Mountains was noted in his journal. Driving directions are available from Google Maps. Today, the mountains are named Karu. Say it again. I'd say Caruso. Okay. Armillo probably called the mountains Navajo, Navajo because he met Navajos there. So he probably coined the phrase or coined the name. We can see at this location that the trading post. is here. There are actually some Indian ruins here. These are the mountains. Goat Springs is located here, and this is an Indian boarding school, so it's on the reservation. I'm guessing they made the negotiations then at the ruin, or near the ruin, with the Goat Springs. Not, not at The trading post was established in 1905. Trade actually started from a wagon near the springs. It has been rebuilt at different locations. So it seems to be a stop worth, a place worth stopping at. Church Rock is a landmark for travel today and probably for Armillo. It's believed that Armillo probably camped within viewing distance and mentioned it by a different name in his journal. It can be located on Google Maps. Again, can you make out the location? So the sites we're talking about are, are a little bit larger than the reference city locations along the highways right here, but here's Church Rock. You have to be careful because there are four Church Rocks in the U.S. Uh, Search for Church Rock in Arizona. There's also a Church Rock in Utah, California, and Rhode Island. Church Rock, as viewed from the highway, it's an intrusive erosional remnant. I, I think this right here is Monument Valley in, in the background. But the intrusive rock is actually mixed in with some sandstone. Kayenta is a town, a name of a regional group of Anastasis, and the name of a geological formation. Navajos referred to the town area as Deep Bog Hole. A trading post was founded there in 1909. At one time, it was advertised as the most distant post office from a railroad in the US. It was a base for numerous archeological and geological expeditions. It's Burger King has a Navajo Code Talkers exhibit. Who has been to Kayanta? Okay. Kayanta is at the southern end of a Navajo sandstone monocline. It's called Comb Ridge and extends 80 miles to the north. So here's Kayanta, and can you see the ridge right here? It's Navajo sandstone, and it's called Comb Ridge on the maps. Here's, here's kind of a close-up right here. Did, did you fly over this and get the aerial pictures, or did you get the online? I thank internet. 
<laughs> and I thank Google Earth for, for the aerial view here. The comb extends into Bear, Bears Ear National Monument. Cliff dwellings are built in the sandstone alcoves. So again, this is the ridge, and it extends up in the bear's ears, is up in this area right here. And there are cliff dwellings in the sandstone alcoves. Remember the coxcomb? It's another sandstone monocline. So here we have the Navajo sandstone. This is the entrada, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so these rock layers are kind of folded over. And so the Entrada is younger than the Navajo. And this location, the layers are not overturned, but they're flat again. Water pocket fold at Capitol Reef is another sandstone monocline. Henry Mountains is a lacolith just like Pine Valley. Navajo monocline, Navajo monocline, Navajo monocline. So they're, they are somewhat common and they are all scenic. Navajo National Monument is just west of Kayenta. Driving directions are available in Google Maps. Runes can be seen by taking a one mile round trip hike to an overlook. Or you can take a plus one half day ranger guided hike. These hikes generally start in late May. Reservations are required for the ranger hike. The monument has campgrounds and a visitor center. So if it's just a drive by, you're gonna need to go to an overlook to see the, the ruins. And these are the ruins, and this is the overlook, which is a little bit more than a one mile round trip hike. Cliff dwellings are frequently built in alcoves. To develop an alcove, there needs to be massive rock, a fracture parallel to the cliff face, and undercutting. Undercutting can be by erosion or seepage pressure from contact springs. Remember contact springs from the water class? The weight of the slab that falls out exceeds the strength of the rock holding it in place. The resulting arch shape supports the rock above, like an arch bridge, so Without this arch shape right here, some of these rocks right here might just fall down. It's kind of a mystery of physics of why it shapes that way, but it does have a function. Again, you have a, on steep cliffs, you generally have sheeting joints parallel to the face. So in back of the alcove here, you've got parallel fractures and they contribute to why this block falls down when it's undercut right here. In Zion National Park, springs frequently occur along the contact because of the permeable Navajo sandstone and the underlying impermeable Kayenta formation create an alcove. So here again is Navajo undercutting along by the, the Kayenta and here the undercutting is by sp spring seepage. This is Weeping Rock. How many have seen the granary near Weeping Rock? It's hard to see, but it's right here. So it's just a little bit upstream from Weeping Rock shuttle stop. But again, Navajo, you've got the Kayenta, and there probably was some undercutting here by the river, but you can also see white staining right here, which indicates that there was a spring area here at one time, or it may just be intermittent in this location here. Where's, we call the seepage is Weeping Rock? 
The seep it, yeah, it's, it's, it's over in this area here. So we're just upstream. This is the alcove immediately upstream from the parking lot at Weeping Rock. Navajo Mountain is a major landmark that can be seen from many locations north and east of Shadow Highway SR-98. Also, it can be seen from the Glen Canyon Recreation Area and can be located on Google Maps. Navajo Mountain, and you have several sighting along SR-98 if you look to the northeast. Again, for reference, here's Kayenta and here's Page. It's a lack of lift like Pine Valley Mountain, Henry Mountains, Abajo Mountains, and LaSalle Range are also lack of lifts. Here, the intrusive rocks have not been exposed by erosion. They're just bent up. They just bent up the uh, or uplifted the sedimentary rocks, and that's what we see. This mountain has cultural significance to the Navajo people and is an integral part of the creation story. The Hopi called it heart of the earth. Climbing the mountain itself is forbidden. And this is a lacolith, so you have intrusives pushing up into sedimentary rocks and they raise the surface above the adjacent ground. Intrusive rocks, where it's spread out like this and uplifted, it's called a lacolith. Page was founded in 1957 to house workers during the construction of Glen Canyon Dam. It was named for John C. Page, a commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation between 1936 and 43. The town was officially incorporated in 1975. Driving directions are available from Google Maps. Sightseeing attractions in the vicinity include John Wesley Powell Museum, Antelope Canyon, Glen Canyon Dam, Horseshoe Bend, and Lone Rock. So I, I saw the dam when it was under construction. I went there with a civil engineering class and we had, had a field trip. And I can't remember, that probably was around 61 or 60. There is an entrance fee to the museum. Outside is a replica of the boat Powell used to explore the Colorado River in 1869. So what's the year? What's this year? 2019, so it's the 150th anniversary that Powell explored the Colorado River. Emma Dean is Powell's wife. The exhibits are about Colorado River history, the city of Page, Glen Canyon Dam, and geology. I don't know if you can make it out, but he named the boat Emma Dean, which was named after his wife. And this is... Yeah, it's a replica. It's a replica. Sightseeing at Horseshoe Bend requires a three-quarter mile walk out to the canyon edge. The rock is Navajo sandstone. The bend was originally a meander on flat land. It became entrenched as the Colorado Plateau was uplifted. Estimated time to create this canyon is about six million years. Parallel fractures are frequent and are called joints. Joints and erosion can result in rock pillars and slot canyons. The horizontal lines are erosional surfaces between sand dunes. So you can see the jointing, it's, it's more vertical. And the horizontal lines are the erosional surfaces between sand dunes. Yes. You have to shuttle there now from uh, Page, you just south of Page, where 96 and 89 come together. They don't let you park there. Anymore. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it started in March. Uh, I, I know they were having. You can't drive down and walk over anymore. <clears throat> I think buses can go there or something like that, but 
we have to park at 96 and 80, 89 just south of 80, when 96 comes in from Al Hyenta. And is there a fee? We're running the show there. I'm not sure. And then who? who? I'm not sure if it's Glen Canyon. I think it's the Glen Canyon folks doing that. So it's the uh, National Park Service that manages it? Uh, I'm not certain. I just know that the shuttle started, and I, I don't know if it's a good thing. Okay. Uh, Glen Canyon in conjunction with that all. But it was just getting so crowded, and there was accidents with cars coming and going onto the highway there. Uh, that's, that's what I heard. There were a lot of traffic problems there. That's progress, unfortunately. Go when there wasn't anybody. <laughs> Yeah, if I, I've never done it, but I heard the, the, hike, the hike involved about half a mile of sand from the parking areas. Has anyone been to Lower or Upper Antelope Canyon? Wow. <laughs> they are slot canyons in the Navajo sandstone. It's a photo paradise. It's operated by the Navajo Nation and Google Maps will provide directions. Slot canyons are eroded by flash floods along a fracture in the rock. The entrance fee here at the lower canyon is on the order of $40. I'm not sure how current that is. The entrance is very, very narrow, and you almost need to step sideways to get in. Going in and out involves stairs, one on each end. Highlights and shadows are a major photography attraction. <clears throat> During 1997, 11 tourists were killed by a flash flood. I believe there was only one stairs at that time. Ropes in boxes are now located along the canyon top at several <coughs> locations. They can be dropped down during a flash flood. So if you walk out at, at the end of the canyon where the stairs go out and come back, you will see along the top of the canyon there are several boxes that contain ropes. The entrance fee at the upper Antelope Canyon is about twice that of the lower Slot Canyon. However, you are driven to the upper canyon from a parking area. There are no stairs. Is that per vehicle or per person? Per person. Per person. Do you know what causes the white haze? Well, there's light, but, but you have to get someone to throw some sand up. And there's dust in the sand. So if you're a photographer, you really need two people, one to take the photo and, and another to throw the sand up. And that's what, that's, I think we, we see light here, but someone probably has thrown some sand at this location here. <coughs> Buckskin Gulch is another slot canyon in the Navajo sandstone. It's near the coxcomb in the Perea Canyon Vermilion Cliffs Wilderness. It's the longest slot canyon in the world. Its length is about 21 miles one way. $5 day permits are available via self-serve envelopes at trailheads. It can be located on Google Maps. Navajo Sandstone Slot Canyon. And right now it's about chest deep in water and quicksand. <laughs> Tell people not to go in there. I expect most of you are familiar with the Narrows in Zion. It's another slot canyon in Navajo Sandstone. How about Canaraville Falls? How many have been there? It's Navajo Sandstone Slot Canyon. It's about 40 miles north of St. George. It can be located on Google Maps. I believe the Navajo sandstone has more slot canyons than any other geologic formation. Another site in the vicinity of Page, the reservoir capacity is about equal to two years annual flow of the Colorado River at the time of construction. 
However, it took 17 years to fill the reservoir. Delays were caused by below average spring runoff, downstream release requirements, and leakage. There's a lot of leakage in, into the sandstone. An aquifer stores groundwater. Water is stored in the Navajo sandstone in connecting fractures and coarse particle strata. Remember all the fractures we could see at Horseshoe Bend? And so you have infiltration, they go and they get, water gets stored in the fractures and they get stored in coarse uh, sand layers within the rock formation at various locations. Do you know where we're at? Sand Hollow, Sand Hollow Reservoir. Began storage in 2003. The lake is contained by two rock fill dams. Six times more water is stored in the sandstone than in the lake itself. What's the advantage of, of storing the water in the sandstone? There's, right, on a lake, the lake surface evaporates. Have you heard of the Lake Powell pipeline? No. <laughs> The proposed Lake Powell pipeline almost follows Armillo's way, except the Paiutes did not grant permission to go through their reservation. The water is pumped uphill to the Coxcomb and from there goes downhill and generates hydropower. Guess where the water is going to be stored? Sand Hollow. So again, the intake is, is here, not too far from the dam. And as it goes uphill to the coxcomb, you've got pumping stations. And then you kind of go downhill, and these are hydro facilities for generating power. And as you can see, it, it bypasses the Indian Reservation, and it will be discharged in Sand Hollow Reservoir here. We think so. He th we think he came through around Pipe Springs or Mocken Springs area. Has anyone been to Rainbow Bridge National Monument? Who hiked? Who took the boat? <laughs> okay. <laughs> to get there involves a long, did you get a, have to get a permit in the, when you hiked it? Uh, I did. You have to have a permit from the Navajos to go around that whole mountain first. Right. Then once you're, you know, once you've got that, then you just go to the north end, go around. You can drive over and then dump yourself out and then hike around the north end of that whole mountain. Was it about 10 months? Did you did it one, do it in one day? Two days. Uh, let's see. No, we did it in three days. Two nights stayed. Okay. One, after we drove over and hiked in a ways camp. Then we did most of the major hike the next day and then camped near Rainbow Ridge, just above it. And then uh, we went out the easy way with a boat. How much, okay. is, how much is the boat ride? Does anyone remember? I don't know. I don't know now. Okay. Well, President Taft designated the National Monument in 1910. It's almost a perfect parabolic arch, 275 feet across. It probably started as an alcove. The Navajo sandstone was undercut by the erosion of the Cayenta Formation. Native Americans have long held the bridge area sacred. Navajos call the bridge rainbow turned to stone. So again, we have the Navajo here and the Kianta right here. So there's been undercutting by, by the Kianta. Which, which way is downstream? I think it's... That side. Okay. That's, yeah, I think it, 
it's a little bit obli oblique here, but I think that's the direction. Is that supposed to be the largest arch in the world? No. no. At one time... The largest bridge. Have you ever seen a bridge and an arch? At one time, there was a bend in the drainage. Eventually, the water flow created an alcove that broke through the ridge. And that's why we have the bridge. So before, and the water impacted the Kanta and eventually undermined this narrow ridge. And we ended up with a bridge at this location, which diverted the, the, the drainage flow. I'm not sure I can answer it, but. <laughs> what are the dangers by putting water under the bridge, which of course happened when Lake Powell spoke? Now, I, the last time I was there, it was way down, so it, it's back to the original, the way I first saw it the first time. What's your opinion on the danger to the Rainbow Bridge with water under the bridge versus water under the bridge? From a stability standpoint, it, it, it's how fast the water draws down. So if, if the lake level drops slowly, uh, there probably isn't too much concern, but with water there is deterioration and it could affect somewhat the underlying Kanta formation. But at this location here where we're mostly in rock, uh, it's, it, it is a consideration, but probably not too much of a concern. The, the real concerns about stability along the banks of reservoirs, particularly if you have soils, is how fast the water is drawn down. If it's drawn down very quickly, then you can have landslides. But in this case right here, there can be effect, but I don't think it's too serious. Yeah, but a flash flood, right, right, would be in the drainage rather than the reservoir level rising. Okay, technically water flows only under a bridge, not an arch. Crawford Arch is correctly named in Zion National Park. There's no water underneath it. Bridge Mountain is incorrect. It should be Arch Mountain. Crawford is not an arch, it's a bridge, so do you... If there's water flowing under the arch, under the <laughs> parabola, it's a bridge. If, if there's no water flowing under, it's, it's an arch. Has anyone seen Lone Rock and Glen Canyon Reservoir? It's it's a solitary pillar in Wawi Bay. It's over 300 feet above the lake level at full pool. Wawi is a Paiute word meaning bitter water. The rock is in the Entrada geologic formation. The formation includes sand dunes younger than the Navajo and some water deposits. The narrowing at the top is possibly thin bedded layers deposited in water. Can you see the high water mark? The water leached out the red iron oxide or is a carbonate stain. The color, the change in color is only superficial. Rock pillars and cliffs in Arches National Monument occur in the Entrada. So the cliffs you see at Arches is in the Entrada sandstone, not the Navajo sandstone. But again, here's the high water mark, the leaching of the color or, or staining, I'm not sure which it is. There were some water deposits in the Entrada and this could be the reason for why it narrows at this point here. We can see the Entrada in the coxcomb. It's younger than the Navajo. So again, here's the Navajo. Here's the Entrada. The rock layers have been folded over. 
What's been cut out here is the Carmel and Temple Cap, which caps uh, the Navajo in the National Park, Zion National Park. Again, we have flat layers here. But we have a monocline and we have Navajo sandstone. Remember, we looked at Lee's Ferry in the forensic class. Uh, last Friday, I attended a brown bag presentation at, at the BLM. The speaker called the ramp going up from the Colorado River Lee's Backbone. First time I had heard that. The geologic name for this landform is the Shinnerump Cliffs or the Brown Cliffs. This location. Again, wh why was the ferry located at this location? Because you had access from both sides getting down to the river. So you had Lee's Backbone which took you down to the river here, and then you had good access to, from the Perea River right here. So that's one of the problems uh, with getting to the Colorado River is, is the steep canyon walls. And it's Glen Canyon upstream and the Marble Canyon downstream. Sure. You see where the Lees is there. That was just a little bit to the left of where the L is in the canyon is where the original proposal was to put the Glen Canyon down. And they decided against it and moved further north. Right. We're actually going to run a tunnel from where the L is down to the Lees Ferry to exit the water. Thank you. Big Water Visitor Center. The BLM Information Office has several exhibits on paleontology and geology. Amenities include drinking water, bathrooms, picnic tables, and it's a good place to get out of the sun. Google Maps provides driving directions. It's fairly new and a nice place to visit. Armillo probably passed through Perea, which is an old town site and a movie site. It has been spelled different ways. The town site existed in the 1870s. It is accessed by an unpaved road I think about six or seven miles. There is a pullout and information signs off of US 89. It can be located on Google Maps. Flash flooding severely damaged the movie set in 1998. The BLM replaced the structures between 1999 and 2001, and then someone lit a fire in 2007 and destroyed the buildings. Several movies were made there, including Outlaw, Josie Wales, Sergeants Three, and Buffalo Bill. Has anyone seen all these three movies except me? <laughs> I'm kind of a Western fan. And, and again, it's fun in, in Westerns to try and figure out where, it was, where the scenes were shot because of the geology. Guess what? Out, Joe. Outlaw Josie Wales was on TV last week. So I took some photos of the TV screen. So you can see the buildings and the Shinnerup rock in, in the background up here. But you can't see it's the correct coloring. Do you recognize Clint Eastwood? Again, you can see the cliffs in the background. But the coloring on the Chinle doesn't really show. A cavern from the Perea movie site was moved to the Little Hollywood Museum in Kanab. The wave is in Perea Canyon Vermilion Cliffs Wilderness. The coxcomb is to the north. Access is by permit only. Driving directions are available in Google Maps as well as there's a trail location 
in Google Maps. I'm not sure how accurate it is, but there is a trail location in Google Maps. Intermittent runoff eroded troughs along joints within the Navajo sandstone. The amount of runoff shrank and became insufficient to cut through. Wind erosion followed. Sets of cross-bedded sand dunes are exposed. Changes in cross-bed directions represent changes in wind direction. Deformed rolling strata could be caused by earthquake liquefaction before the sand became rock. The stratification is caused by sand particles of different sizes. Iron oxide is red, and it's the basic color. If all the iron oxide is removed by fluids, the rock becomes white. Colors in between result from fluids adding and removing iron minerals. So you can kind of see the rolling right here. And there may have been an earthquake that liquefied the saturated sand at one time at this location. Again, the, the strata right here is different grain sizes. You can see this is a different sand dune than this is sand dune, which is different from this sand dune. And again, the sand dunes uh, cross bedding change with changes in wind direction. White Pockets is another photographer's dream. It is in the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument, which was established during the year 2000. It is recommended to go there from the south via 89A. Thick sand occurs on the unpaved access road. Location is shown on Google Maps. So get your camera. Kanab, named for a Paiute word meaning place of the willows. It's the seat of Kane County. In 1864, a fort was built on the east bank of the Kanab Creek, settled by 10 Mormon families in 1870, referred to as Little Hollywood because it was a base camp for several Western TV series and movies. In 1912, Zane Gregg lived there while writing his Writers of the Purple Sage. Grand Staircase Information Office is located in Kanab, and its location is identified on Google Maps. The Kanab Little Hollywood Museum is identified in Google Maps. Kanab also has a two to three day event called Western Legends Roundup. Has anyone been there? It includes a parade food, quick draw contest, and old movie and TV stars. I took these photos about five years ago. Do you recognize the people? Again, Clint Western, uh, Clint Walker is in Westerns, but I don't know what Ruth Buzzy has to do with Westerns. What do you associate Ruth, Ruth Buzzy with? Laughing. So I'm not, not sure what the relationship is there, but she was there. And she was signing autographs, or she was signing photos of autographs for $10. So when you were <laughs> kind of walking around the table trying to take a photograph, she always had her head down, because I think she preferred you to buy a autographed photo for $10, but this one was free. Something else to see in Kanab, location identified in Google Maps. Fredonio was first settled in 1865, like Kanab. It's on the east side of Kanab Creek. Should I just make one more comment about Kanab? Yes. There's a, a national monument uh, uh, visitor center there, but there's also the BLM want to go probably to both, but if you want to hike or go see things around or get an idea of what's around that, go to the BLM office on the south side, which is one of the 
Yeah, I, I think the BLM offices on 89A were the, uh, I think what you're calling the National Park Sur uh, National Monument offices on 89. Just, yeah, just, just yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so go to both. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. If you're going to visit there, go to both because you'll be disappointed if you just go to one and not the other. It's it's uh, BLM and Canal where you get your permit to do the wave at the Grand Staircase on East on 89. Yeah, the Grand Staircase. <laughs> yeah, and, and and why is it a good idea that there's permitting for the wave? Historically, they couldn't control the crowd. Well, that, and and from a user standpoint, not not from a management standpoint, from a from a user standpoint, why am I glad that they only allow 20 people to go there? Because you don't have people in the foreground of all your photographs. That's right. <laughs> if you had 100 people it's there. It, it's, it is. Area that you're trying to get the, the neatest photographs. So it's, well, that whole area around there is gorgeous. it's very practical. So if there were more people there, as I say, it would be hard to take a photograph without getting someone else in it. Fredonia was first settled in 1865. Like Kanab, it's on the east side of the Kanab Creek. It's named for freedom from federal laws against polygamy. Donna refers to a woman. So literally, it's free Donna. Polygamists lived in Kanab, sent their wives to Fredonia to avoid capture by the federal marshals. During the tourist season, the museum and park is open Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Arizona time. A donation is expected. Does anyone know what Red Pueblo refers to? Steve, do you know? A campsite that, that Armijo uh, visited and realized that it was, it had happened. I have my own feelings about exactly where that is if somebody actually wants to go do it, but it's on private property. So it's, it's, it's name is based on an entrance in the, his journal? Okay. Grand Staircase. Several of the cliffs of the Grand Staircase can be seen between Fredonia and Colorado City. The best viewpoint of the staircase is from Lefevre Overlook on 89A, and then going down 89A into Fredonia. Driving along Arizona 389, we can see the chocolate, vermilion, and white cliffs. Highway view of chocolate cliffs near Fredonia. They are capped by the Shinnerump. So you have the Shinnerump here, the upper red of the Moenkopi, and then the Schnobkaib. Remember Schnobkaib? So the rock layering you see right here is the same we see at Schnobkog when we go to Costco. The top of Canaan Mountain is the historical location of a large LDS co-op cattle ranch. The mountain was named by a member of Powell's survey, refers to low mountain in Hebrew. The white cliffs or Navajo sandstone don't have horizontal layering. The underlying vermilion cliffs or Kayenta formation do. The lower flanks of the mountain cliffs are landslides caused by the petrified forest member of the Chinle formation, which is the blue clay in St. George. So these areas right here are all landslides. And we can't see the petrified forest because they've kind of been buried by the landslides. White is not always white, it can be vermilion. But one way to tell the difference between Vermilion Navajo and Vermilion Kayenta is the layering. Kayenta has horizontal bedding, Navajo doesn't. This may have been Armillo's December 25th stop that was noted as Water of the Old Women. 
Moccasin Creek might have been a, a, uh, another interpretation. It's one of the 20 least visited national monuments in the West. Consists of 40 acres, surrounded by the Paiute Indian Reservation. 1860s, Mormon pioneers from St. George established a large cattle ranch here. 1872, a protective fort, later called Windsor Castle, was constructed over the main spring. The site served as a way station for people traveling across the Arizona Strip. The fort and ranch was purchased by Brigham Young for the LDS Church. At one time, it served as a refuge for polygamist wives during the 1880s and 1890s. The LDS Church lost ownership of the property because of polygamy penalties. 1907, the reservation was established. 1923, Pipe Ranch was purchased and became a national monument. It's also a good rest stop as you're heading to North Rim of Grand Canyon. Windsor Castle, the fort. Colorado City, founded as Millennial City by polygamists in 1909. 1913, name changed to Short Creek. 1958, name changed to Colorado City after national notoriety from a polygamy raid. Warren Jeffs lived here. A few years ago, a dairy store was the curiosity stop. Now we can stop at a microbrewery. So there, there is progress. Does anyone know how it got the name Colorado City? Smithsonian Butte can be seen from SR 59. It was named by Clarence Duncan, Duncan, a geologist who worked with Powell. It is also the turnoff to an unpaved road that was used to link the north rim of the Grand Canyon to Zion National Park between 1924 and 1928, before Mount Carmel Highway was built. The road location is outlined in red. The drive involves narrow passages with steep drop-offs, sand, but there are tremendous views of Zion National Park cliffs. So right here is the road that goes to Highway 9. By someone, yeah, someone in Powell's survey group. Yes? You could hazard a guess that Colorado City got its name because Colorado means red, and so they have the red rocks and the red dirt. That's, yeah, uh, that's a good point. I was just going to say, historically, the reason why you even get, you know, you mentioned that Pipe Spring is one of the least visited national monuments. The only reason why it became a national monument they needed a rest stop between Zion and the North Rim and the Grand Canyon. <laughs> when they were doing that loop, they started in Cedar City off the railroad, go to Zion, then down to the Grand Canyon, then up through Kanab to Rice Canyon, over to Cedar Breaks and back to Cedar City to catch the train again or buses in later years. And so they needed a rest stop, and uh, those guys said, we'll make it a national. It has clean restrooms, and it's also a good stop between St. George and, and the North Rim. Now, is Colorado City in Arizona or Utah? It's, it's, in, it's in Arizona, but Hillsdale is in, is in Utah. It's right on the state line. It's right on the state line. Smithsonian Butte, as seen from SR 59. This is the historic Rockfield Bridge over the Virgin River along the 1924-28 Travelway. So this bridge was actually built so they could get from the North Rim to Zion between 1924-1928. The bridge is also crossed when driving between Rockville and Grafton. It was built 
with Zion National Park dollars. And, it, and National Park dollars should not be built out of the park itself. So it's. <laughs> there are good views of Zion National Park cliffs along US 89. Now we have to drop down over the hurricane cliffs. Four travelways exist in the area going down the cliff. An unpaved road referred to as Navajo Trail Road, the honeymoon trail that Armillo probably followed, our Shadow Highway SR-59, and SR-9, which goes to Zion National Park. The arrows point to rock layers that have near vertical faces. They are the primary barriers to going down the Hurricane Cliffs side hill. So again, traveling, you don't go straight down a hill. You go it on an angle like this right here. But because of these vertical cliffs right here, they create vertical barriers. At this location, the vertical barrier layers have to been appear to have been flattened, allowing side hill travel. Geology maps indicate the disruption is echelon faulting. I believe there could have been landsliding, but you can see the barriers here, but they don't extend through here. So you can kind of go side hill through this area here and you don't have to deal with steep vertical cliffs. Yeah, it's, it's down below, and, that, and that's, that's another reason why I think people think our meal traveled this way, because they think another uh, journal entry was uh, Warren Valley. <coughs> At this location, the vertical barrier layers have been buried by lava flows, allowing side hill travel. So again, the Shadow Highway is SR-95, but this area right here is lava flows, and it kind of flattened out these vertical barriers right here. At this location, SR goes down side hill through the Moenkopi Formation, which overlies the vertical barrier layers. So the vertical barrier layers stop here. This is a different rock formation. It's a lot softer and it doesn't have vertical cliffs. So you have access down through the hurricane cliffs at this location. At this location, the vertical barrier layers are ramped down by echelon faulting. So can you see the ramp and how it's been dropped down? So it actually has a ramp here and this down drop was caused by faulting. Does, does anyone know where this road goes? It's called the Navajo Trail Road. I can see it on Google Earth and I can see it on the topo maps, but I'm not sure exactly. Is it north of Hurricane? No, no, this is, this is quite a ways south. Oh, quite a ways south. Yeah, so it's probably a couple of miles south of, of Honeymoon Trail. So is it north of Gold's Wash? Yeah, it'd be north, no, it'd be south of Gold's Wash. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, 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 for, it's quite a ways south of that, south of that yeah. Is it, how is it? Is it south of the... It's south of Honeymoon, about oh, two... South of Honeymoon. South of Honeymoon, oh, about two... That, that may have been two miles. a road they built for uh, to haul lumber off of the mountain below. They I, came back and came down off of the cliffs there. That could be. Uh, to get to Mount Trumbull, you go a little bit further south, and the way, again, you get over the cliffs there is through lava flows. So what's this one called? Well, uh, on, on Google Maps and Google Earth and Topo Maps, it's referred to as Navajo Trail Road. Okay. But, but there, are, there are many Navajo Trail Roads at, at, uh, in different states. Okay, one last geologic footnote. At Pine Valley Mountain, the sedimentary rocks have been eroded away 
exposing the intrusive, intrusive rocks of the Lakaleth. At Navajo Mountain, the intrusive rocks were not exposed. We can see both the intrusive rocks and the pink cliffs of Bryce Canyon and Cedar Breaks from St. George. So when you again look at Pine Valley Mountain, these are the pink cliffs or the red clarion right here. And then you can kind of see a change in topography. These are actually the intrusive rocks. And all the material, all the sediments above have been removed by erosion. So take a look at today is probably a good day. I think the skies are clear. So you can see the intrusive rocks on Pine Valley Mountain. That's right, okay. <laughs> Wait a month. <laughs> okay, we are running out of time. Uh, Steve in his book discusses other sightseeing or stopping locations extending to the Nevada border. One last question. What do geologists and ancestral Native Americans have a common interest in? Sandstone cliffs. What happens in sandstone cliffs? Alcoves. What happens in alcoves? Cliff dwellings. So most, most of the time, all cliff dwellings, except for Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico, which is in soft tuft that they excavated into. But to get natural openings or alcoves, you're probably going to need a sandstone formation. Remember how the Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde cliff dwellings are located along the same sandstone ridge? So geologists and ancestral Native Americans like sandstone. Last class next week, and I'm going to combine both Nevada and California, and it's not border but shadow highways. So, any, any questions? Is anyone interested in, in learning how to extract GPS coordinates from their smartphone photos? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll cover that at the end of next class. And those of you who are not interested, uh, feel free to leave, so. Okay, one more class.